Hello everyone, Dave Landry here from DaveLandry.com, and this is the week in charts. I just want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. If you're watching the recording of this and you want to attend live, love to have you. DaveLandry.com slash webinar. Register even if the date is old. I rarely remember to put the date in. So what are we going to talk about? Current market conditions? Oh boy, I have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock, and I doubt there'll be any crypto picks, but if there is, we'll go to crypto first. Just put a dollar sign in front of what you want me to look at. Wait until we get the live charts for those stock picks, too. So what are we going to focus on? Well, the market in your head, and that's going to make a lot more sense in a little while. And this is something I've kind of talked about in the past, and it'll make, again, it'll make sense in one second. Plus, I've got a lot of charts I want to go through tonight and trading opening gap reversals. We had one nice little setup during the week, although, truth be told, I didn't make a whole lot of money on it, but it was better than poking. I made a little bit, a couple of points. This is the volume screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up. All predictions are about the future. Man, a lot of stuff can come through now and then. All right, we can charts. Let's look at some charts. What a concept. All right, one thing I woke up thinking about this morning, <laughs> and believe me, things I wake up thinking about have changed over the years, but one thing I thought about is how the volatility has increased so much. And I was doing a little research this morning, trying to figure out a way to incorporate horizontal, um, horizontal, historical volatility to possibly avoid some, some intraday trades, like when not to trade. And that's the thing. I think as evolution, a trader, when you start out, you're just looking for things to trade, looking for setups, 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 and looking for all these different methodologies and holy grail hunting. And then I think as you get a little bit more mature, you realize that the secret of trading is knowing when not to trade. So that's sort of what I was doing this morning, just looking to see if there are times when the ranges are small and the volatility is dropping off. And anyway, in the process, I thought it'd be kind of cool to show you, I know you want to party with me, just the 50-day HV on the spiders. And you can see it drop for a long, long time. As a general statement, if a market is generally working its way higher, the volatility is going to drop off because it's an orderly climb. And this is historical volatility. This is plotted in ACP, but you can get it to other platforms. And I do have the formula for it for Telechart on the back end of my website and somewhere back there too i might have better stack formula but anyway you could see that volatility dropped as the trend rose and in general it's kind of been riding uh, working its way higher i should say and even though the market trended a little bit you see it did come off a little in here for the most part longer term it has risen substantially in fact we're twice where we were a while back and somebody in the group was asking what did I mean by like the volatility and like the e-minis and my point was that if you're trying to trade e-minis intraday and at least hold on for a little while then it almost takes about a 30 point stop and that's pretty that's a pretty wide stop but you can see obviously the sell off we had recently followed by the sharp retrace volatility has increased again so one reason I wanted to show you that the volatility is because the fact that it doubled means that your parameters are going to be a lot dip, more different if you're doing something on an intraday basis. And you're going to probably need much wider stops. And one thing that you can do is trade at a smaller size. And I'm amazed that I've had some really good days, specifically last week, not so much this week, but last week, trading at a fairly small size. So if you don't walk away with anything tonight from this screen here, just know that the volatility has increased to a point where you might need to back down on your share size, at least on the intraday stuff, not so much on the daily stuff. We kind of keep that a fixed 2%, but the charts in and of themselves will help us to adjust to that because they'll they'll have wider ranges and wider and a higher volatility too. Now, real quick, I want to show you the where we are with the TFM. 10% system. The buy line is this green line in here, which could also be called the sell line if you prefer. 
And we sell when it's below that, provided it's also below on a closing basis, the 50 week closing high. That's that's it for a sell. A buy is a close above the buy line and two lows or two days of Landry light to be more specific above the 50 week moving average. We'll take a look at some Landry light here in just one second. So if you squint your eyes, 4289.56 would be a sell. So if we close tomorrow, God forbid, below that level, that would be a sell signal. Down below is just how far we are from that 50 week closing high. And it was pretty cool. We, as of, I think it was yesterday, we were less than 5% away from all time highs in S&P 500. So that's pretty impressive, right? Well, we'll take a look at that in the live charts in one minute, and maybe it's not quite as impressive as it looks. But as a general statement, as long as you stay long a market, when it's within 10% of its 50-week closing high, you'll probably do okay. And when it drops more than 10% below its 50-week closing high, now this is the S&P 500, I said the market, but in this case, this system is specifically designed with the S&P 500 in mind based on the general volatility of it, longer term at least. But it, as a general statement, again, if you stay long as long as you're within 10% of all-time highs, you're probably gonna do okay. And Greg Morris has, has done some research and has talked about the fact that the market usually doesn't go straight down off of all-time highs. It, it does some zigs and zags in between. And maybe that's why this system works is because it does take a little while to trigger sometimes, although in the pandemic, it, it triggered quickly, which I'll show you here right now. But it does give you a little time to get out. And now keep in mind, these are weekly bars. And yeah, it did kind of begin to implode off of all time highs here. But you had two weeks to get out, and you also had a sell signal within that first week down. And I can't guarantee you'll miss every bear market by getting out on these sell signals, but every bear market over the last 100 and something years that I can get data, 120 years, it, you would have stayed out of every bear market and exited right before they started in earnest. Now, the last signal, as I've been saying quite a bit, very proud of that last signal, last sell signal, because it got us out of the market and the market began to implode a little bit. Uh, if you were looking at this, though, on a mechanical basis, like, well, Dave, you got it two or 3% higher, two lows above the, this should be moved over just a smidge to the right, two lows above the 50 week moving average and a close above the buy line. And you can see you got out here and you actually got in a little higher. It's like, well, Dave, that's kind of a whipsaw. Well, as I preach, that was a pretty serious slide in here. And I had quite a few people call me in a bit of a panic and stealing a line from Ian McActivy, who's no longer with us, great guy. It's a diaper change moment. So the whole system is sort of designed around avoiding these diaper change moments. And I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully we don't get a sell signal but I really think it pays to pay attention. If we do get a sell signal, we'll get out. And if we have to get right back in, so what? Okay. Greg was visiting a couple of years back and we were talking about market timing and such. I know you probably want to party with us. He's actually fun to party with. <laughs> we like to get in a little trouble, but uh, we do talk about markets a little bit. Anyway, as he said, and I think he also reread his book and it's, it's in there too. Whipsaws are frustrating, bear markets are devastating. You can survive frustration. And as we're going live, I was thinking, let's say you had a million dollars in the market, you're pretty close to retirement, all of a sudden you lose $300,000. Well, actually it's more than 300,000 because if you go all the way to the top, it's probably about $400,000, right? Or at least 350 or more. But you would have lost maybe $50,000 coming in, maybe 100, and then you lose 300 more in the rest of the slide. I know my math's a little off because it wouldn't be quite 300 more, but you get the idea. You're down here with nearly half your money gone. And if you only have a million dollars saved up for retirement, and Greg uses the same argument too, you lose half of it or almost half of it, then your retirement's gonna change drastically. If you've got $10 million, you lose half, eh, 
you might have to back off of some activities. Anyway, I just thought that was kind of interesting to, to show you guys where we are in the process. We need to pay attention to that. One thing I, I found kind of interesting is Bitcoin is being promoted as this inflation hedge and everything else. And notice what happened recently, and you can look at what happens longer term too, but this is Bitcoin in the, in the, in the back and black also. Sounds like an ACD album, right? Uh, and then this is the P's right here. Big slide in the P's, big slide in Bitcoin. So it's kind of a, a no place to run, no place to hide. And it's certainly not working as a safe haven just yet. Longer term, I'm actually I'm actually pretty bullish on Bitcoin. I'm currently short, net short Bitcoin. I do have a little bit that I'm experimenting with in a, kind of a HODL situation, HODL, on a wallet. But uh, other than that, I mean, it's a tiny amount. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking about it. <laughs> but I am net short Bitcoin at the moment. Longer term, I think it has potential. And one thing that's in the back of my head that I want to work on is 10 things that, that concern me about crypto. And it's, I've been thinking about this for six months. I wish I would have published it five months ago <laughs> so it wouldn't look like it was after the fact. But the number one thing I would talk about is the fact that there's a lot of paper Bitcoin out there. And not enough time to get into it tonight, but if there truly was only 18 million in current supply and 21 million max, I think that Bitcoin could easily be a million dollars right now. But I think what's stopping that from happening, or maybe a little bit less than it, maybe a half a million, but what's stopping that from happening is there's a lot of derivative products out there, and there's a lot more paper Bitcoin, so to speak, than in reality and that's derivatives and uh, let's say if you if you look on the fine print of some exchanges then i need to see if i can dig it out for you but in some cases they say they might not have your bitcoin if you want it so that tells me right there that maybe there's some fun and games going on maybe there's some bucketing of orders why wouldn't they have bitcoin to deliver to you so anyway that's another conversation altogether didn't be the back in that but that's one reason I'm bullish longer term. Unfortunately, though, all the, the, the paper Bitcoin out there dilutes the supply. So anyway, market big sell-off, Bitcoin big sell-off. So no place to run, no place to hide. Here's Solana. This is one that I'm actually short to. And you can see the Landry light down below. And Landry light just means lows or greater than the moving average, any average you want. In this case, I've got 30 EMA and 30 EMA down here for uptrends and highs or less than the moving average for downtrends. And that stupid little indicator, silly little indicator, whatever you call it, it's pretty darn cool. And I've, I, as I've said before, I've, I'll see a presentation, somebody will have 100 or 200 or 300 buys and sells on a chart all over the place. And if you just look at the, the Landry lights, like, oh, well, okay, this is an uptrend, okay. A little choppy in here, a little little bit of an uptrend trying to get going, a little choppy. This is an uptrend. And for the most part, this is a downtrend. Once things begin to trend, and I guess that's the key phrase in that sentence, then all trend following systems are pretty much going to look alike. Although I, I really like the stuff I do, you'll find that a lot of them will look alike. So I would recommend to keep it simple. Simpler is better when it comes to markets. So let's take a look at Bitcoin. Bitcoin topped out last November. It was interesting because the shit coins, S-H-Y-T, were doing really good back then. In fact, I remember Thanksgiving Day was one of the best days I've ever had in crypto. I think I hit six or seven profit targets. I had the video somewhere on YouTube. And I didn't really pay that much attention to Bitcoin at the time and realize how bad Bitcoin was beginning to uh, fall. But anyway, the point I just want to make is follow the Landry light. Stay in the light. The light is good. <laughs> and you can see that you, for the most part, would have been short the whole way. And one thing that I played around with a little bit here and there, another one of those you want to party with me things, is pivot points around the 30 EMA. And this one's a little bit higher than this one, but you get the idea. 
if you could survive these pivot points, sometimes you could catch some pretty amazing trends. Write that down. And you might want to use that as a little fodder for your own research. All right, trading opening gap reversals. So I use FinViz to show me morning gaps. I think you might be able to do it with the new telechart. I call it the new telechart, it's been out forever. But I've been using the old version up until about a week or two ago, a few weeks ago. But what you're looking for is a serious, serious downtrend for a short, okay? And ideally some sort of pullback or TKO type of move to the upside. And then you're looking for that big gap higher. Now it's a little bit easier to wrap your head around an opening gap reversal on the upside because let's say it's a big thick stock that people want to own, that institutions own. And when it gaps lower, it becomes an opportunity to buy it on sale for these people, or let's say you're an institution and you need to own some on your balance sheet. It's a chance for an institution with incredible amounts of liquidity in the market to go in and buy it. When it's on the short side, you kind of got to you kind of have to wrap your head around it in different ways. Like the shorts, like if you look at the pile on the markets, they may be squeezed out and it may have flushed them all out, hence the gap. And it, it's kind of just the opposite. There's a lot of things you kind of have to wrap your head around, but it does work on the short side. I'd much pr prefer playing the long side, but you have to play the hands that's, that's dealt, especially when the market gets questionable like it is now. Anyway, a gap higher. What's fascinating is it really didn't get much above that gap and pretty much imploded. Now, in hindsight, at the end of the day, of course, you're like, oh, wow, I'll just short at 130 and I get out to close, maybe take some profits, but it's down about 10 points or nine points, whatever, and then get out seven or eight points later on the close. Well, it's not quite that easy, but you can't lose sight of the fact that sometimes it almost is. And sometimes markets, stocks, I should say, will find that high on that opening gap reverse. The same thing goes for indices too. By the way, you don't want to try to short a stock making all-time highs on a big gap higher. You want the trend to be established and you want to sell short in the direction of the trend. And again, it just kind of imploded. It looks like a textbook setup. Well, it wasn't quite so easy in today. So I do remember it having a little bit of a blip up above the gap. I did wait for it to begin to sell off a little bit. So I got in right around here, I think 127.50 exactly. And I had a three point trail and stop. And I knew that that wasn't tight enough. And I knew I should probably close my eyes and put a stop above the high and not trail it. But it's been a bumpy week and I felt like I needed the money and, and I didn't want to risk a whole lot of money. So I put a three point trailing stop in and I did get stopped out. And I didn't make a whole lot on it, maybe like a point or so, but better than a poke in the eye, but not enough to brag about. But it did make a nice little slide down. And I remember right around here thinking, well, I'm glad I got out. And then, of course, it imploded the rest of the day. And I, I took it off my screen because I knew I would be going after it again and again. And sometimes it ends badly. I call that a Steve, it could be a Steve Ladd type of trade. Sometimes it's prudent to go back in a second for a second wave, but I didn't want to press my luck in this particular case. Anyway, that's opening gap reversals. This slide's from a while back. So some of it is biased to the upside. But the bottom line is you want it to be a big, thick stock. You want to make sure there's people trapped on the wrong side of the market. So you want a, you want a lot of players in there. I've I've tried with thinner stocks, but maybe the gap wipes out the people or whatever, and there's nobody else to come in after them. So you need a lot of players in the market. It's kind of just the opposite of what I look for with the core methodology. I'm looking with the core methodology. I'm looking for 
somewhat thinner issues, although we do go after some thick stocks every now and then. But we're looking for that inefficiency. And with the uh, with the opening gap reversals, we're actually looking for bigger cap stocks. And we're looking for some sort of shakeout one way or the other with the opening gap. So as I said earlier, like on the upside, uh, an institution might come in because they missed the boat or they need to own the stock. The same might hold true for individual traders, especially if they got in and then it gaps down, they get out, and then they jump right back in. Remember, it's all psychology. Embracing your own psychology and working to read the psychology of others. Now, in this case, lucky shorts would be just the opposite. Unlucky shorts are trapped and they, they just buy in at whatever cost because they're screwed, a margin is coming down on them, or they're forced out, or their broker exits it. And all that buying exhausts itself. And they then they might say, well, you know what? It's coming back in. I'm going to put those shorts right back on. Okay. Kind of reminds me of uh, what's the guy from uh, Hangover, Mr. Chan? <laughs> you on me, I on you. So that's kind of what the. I wish I didn't have to keep this PG, PG 13. It'd be much more funnier. <laughs> so again, you want a strong trend. You don't want to just trade gaps willy nilly. You don't want to trade the burning dogs, which is at brand new lows for buys or brand new highs for sell short. All right, so I didn't really have a post of the week this week. I was looking at some of the setups and you guys were on a lot of the same setups that I was showing my clients. So I didn't want to show those, but I've been talking a lot about Douglas and one of the posts was about Douglas and it sort of got me in the mood to, to talk about a little bit about Discipline Trader tonight. Only literally five or ten pages in is is where most of the uh, sub of presentation the presentation comes from today, and certainly a hundred percent of the ins of the inspiration comes from that. So, just a couple of, of things which I thought were kind of interesting. And uh, George said, "It seems like the odds are against us with a ninety percent failure rate. Can it become more than ten percent?" And I said, probably not, unless, of course, you don't micromanage, focus on one thing versus everything, trade at a small size while learning, and all the other stuff that I preach, but don't always do, of course, LOL. So I thought that was kind of good to include my own little post in there. Um, George posted this to begin with. But anyway, I recommend you read it. I've got, got it literally, literally right here, and I'm looking forward to going through my notes one more time. A lot of the things that... Douglas talks about is is how the market is all in your head. And I've done presentations before where I've showed I, I wanted to find a very obscure market that went into a horrible bear market. And I figured cocoa would be a good one. Even when I was a commodity trader, I didn't trade cocoa that much. Cocoa is kind of a crazy market to trade. So I figured there weren't a lot of people that trade it. And whenever I speak in person or whatever, and I said, okay, how many of you were stressed out by the, I think it was 2017, maybe a little bit earlier, bear market in cocoa. And so far, not one person has raised their hand. What was a horrible bear market? Why was it that stressful? It wasn't stressful because nobody was trading it, at least in my audience. So a lot of times the market, or all the time, it's kind of in your head. Now, what do I mean by that? And this is, again, just the first few pages into Douglas's book. In fact, this is in the preface. The markets have absolutely no power or control over you. No expectation of your behavior and no regard for your welfare. Without no regard for the welfare is pretty tough. And believe me, it's tough when I'm watching the screen thinking what the market should do, especially since I'm already in a position, okay? And already have that built-in bias, right? And it's not doing what I think it's going to do. And one of the things I've been saying a lot lately is the market will do the most obvious in an unobvious manner. If it's going to trend lower, it's going to have a big shakeout to the upside first, okay? And that's the kind of things that's been kind of hard to trade lately. 
is these the short side and then have to deal with these big knockout moves and stuff. But the markets don't have any power over you. You can only control yourself. In fact, you can't control or manipulate the markets, right? And the markets have absolutely no power or control over you. The responsibility for what you perceive and for your resulting behavior resides only in you. The only thing you can control is yourself. And heavy is the head that wears a crown. And it's tough. And I, my shower thought earlier as I was getting ready for this presentation is that we all struggle in this business and these scumbags out there that pretend it's all easy, they're probably not real traders. And I know some of them are going to jail that I really don't, I, don't, I never did like these fellows. <laughs> And it just goes to show you that they're not real traders and they're not getting their ass handed to them quite often. You know, it, it, it really is a Janet Jackson type of, of world. I had one of my best weeks ever on the intraday stuff last week. And this week, I'm, uh, I'm actually not getting creamed, but I'm negative so far this week for the week. Just trying to keep a head around above the water and it's tough. And even last week, I was surprised at the end results because it wasn't it didn't feel like it was an easy week. So don't feel lonely if you're struggling and fairly new to trading. It will get easier, it'll never get easy. But the one thing, and I hate to say this because I don't want to scare you away, but the one thing that's a little scary is the longer you've been at this, sometimes the harder it is when the market in your mind, like we're talking about, right, is is not doing what you think it should do. The mark, what is is right. Anyway, I found this slide which had some classic Douglas on it when I was putting together my presentation, and we've been talking a lot about the pre-mortem, and that's a very important thing to do, and something I've been focusing a lot on. That's doing the time traveling how am i going to feel when i'm doing my post-mortem on this trade is this really the best trade that i can find in the post-mortem you'll go back and say ah what the hell was i thinking you'll find yourself doing that quite a bit that's okay it means you're growing and learning but the more you do going into it and the better the trade is going into it the better outcome you're going to have like papa john better ingredients better pizza so a better pre-mortem, garbage in, garbage out, the better off you are going to be in the trade. If you can put on a trade without hesitation, take it off without emotional discomfort, you have accepted the risk. And, and lately, I've been a little extra emotional lately, and I've been having some discomfort. And my wife pointed out that I've been a little grouchy lately. <laughs> You know, I've been trying to explain to her that with volatility is whack like this, there is an opportunity if you can keep your head while everybody else is losing theirs. But yes, you have to accept that risk. And if you're newer to trading and you're really stressed out, bump your share size down. And I've bumped my share size down on intraday stuff at least to help me be a little less grouchy and a little less emotional. Now, one thing I've talked about a lot, George says done. All right, fantastic. So you're going to bump your share size down. Good, good. You know, and here's the thing. Here's the other thing I was thinking about in the shower. I was thinking about you, George. <laughs> Dave, the things you think about in the shower change. I think you're going to be okay longer term, although it might not feel like it right now. George had a not so good first year of trading, but I think it's reasonable tuition. And if I had to bet on somebody, I would bet on George because he had a bad first year and he hasn't quite given up just yet. And in fact, I don't think he is going to give up. And as opposed to somebody who has immediate success, I, I've never had anyone that I can remember at least. And if you're you're out there, let me know. But I've never had anyone that had immediate success following my stuff, such as my trading service where there's official recommendation so to speak i've never had anybody come in and follow it and make a lot of money because conditions are great 
I've never had that person make it as a trader. They seem to fall off the face of the earth. And that instant success can really hurt you. And I've talked about this many times before, but that's where you end up chasing that high, but it was working so well. Most dangerous phrase in trading. Six, six sentences, six, six words. Now I talk a lot about being flippant. It means that you do what you have to do when you have to do it and you don't care. And provided that you've got a really good pre-mortem going in and you accept that trade, then you could be flippant, okay? And as I confess quite often, I'm an emotional guy. I also, as recommended, I can never remember the name of the book, but it was a good book. Uh, Larry Williams' son wrote a book on trading psychology. And as I said a thousand times, it said, take a personality test. My agreeableness was like off the charts, meaning that I think that I'm right. <laughs> and as I said before, I told my wife and kids, and they looked at me like I pooed my pants. Anyway, essentially what you fear is not the markets, but rather your inability to do what you need to do without hesitation. And one thing I've been working on lately, especially on intraday stuff, and the reason I keep bringing up the intraday stuff is I spend, I actually spend a lot of time telling you not to day trade, but since I'm here, I kind of feel like there's some opportunities that I can take in ETFs and especially in something like the opening gap reversals and occasionally a Russian doll, which is you have a daily setup and then you take an intraday setup, maybe an intraday breakout off a pullback or something like that. We've talked about that quite a bit. If you want to know more about that, I have the quick clips on YouTube if you're not a member of of DaveLander.com. But this is key right here. If you can reach a point where you do this one little sentence and you're flipping about it, you have you have arrived. Don't confuse the issue with facts. One of my favorite things to say, one of you guys brought up Bill Clinton, this reminded me of this. And Mr. Bill Clinton, what is is? No, uh, no Chewbacca theory there to argue against the market. What the market is doing is what the market is doing. The price of the instrument, the ask, is the lowest amount that someone will sell to you, whatever that it is, whatever market. The value of the instrument is the bid, and that's the lowest amount that someone will pay you for it. What is, is. The bid is the bid, the ask is the ask. You get what you get, you don't throw a fit. You might not like it, and by the way, statistically, you won't. There's been, his name escapes me at the moment, but I've done complete presentations on this based on stuff that some of you guys had sent me, actually one of you girls, based on the fact that you're almost always in a drawdown. Robert Frey, I think is his name, not to be confused with Robert Gray, who I think is a jazz musician or a guitarist or something, but anyway. More often than not, you're going to be in a drawdown, meaning that the positions are going to go against you, and that can be tough. And we've talked about this quite a bit, the neurology of it all, the emotions of a negative observation or a losing trade or losing in a trade and watching it worse. The emotions of that have twice the impact of a positive trade or a positive observation. The reason I'm talking about observations is my ultimate goal, is even, with, even with the intraday stuff, would be to put it on and go about my life and let the stops and everything do as it may. But I am a little guilty of watching that screen a little too much. Now, all this got me thinking about introspection and perpetual distortion. And I think, I know that Douglas talks a lot about perception. And I think he talks about perceptual distortion and what's the other one selective perception and those are two things that are very dangerous and I've there's some other authors that have talked quite a bit about this anyway this definition is pretty good perceive interpret or look at someone or something in a particular way now let's say you're long stocks or crypto or whatever and the market is going down and has a little bit of a rally, pullback, right? And so far, it just looks like a little bit of a bounce. You look at that, and in your head, you're hoping, smoking the hopium, right? 
you're hoping that it's a big, huge uptrend. And you might actually see that as an uptrend and think that, oh, there's an uptrend developing. I'm going to be fine. Now, let's say that you're short, okay? You want the market to go down and the market's going up, 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 up. So it's going down a little bit. You're like, oh, yeah, that's it. It's top. It's done. It's headed lower. I'm going to be just fine. <laughs> Was it the Tom McCullen said his his drill sergeant said hope as in birth control is not a strategy in warfare <laughs> something like that. Now what's amazing is I've said this a thousand times too and it, it, what's great is a lot of these books are in public domain so you could just uh, download them on the internet for free. And uh, I bought I probably have three or four copies of this GC Selden book laying around. Just because I want an actual book, I don't want to download and print it or read it on a computer or a phone or whatever. I just want an actual book in my hands, something nice and binded or whatever. But um, trying to think of the name of the company, I can't think of Cosmos Classics or something like that. Is a lot of these little books, and it's a, it's a little book, but it was written probably 120 years ago by G. C. Selden, maybe even longer. One of the greatest difficulties encountered by the active trader is that of keeping his mind in a balanced and unprejudiced condition when he is heavily committed to either the long side or the short side of the market. Amen, my brother from another mother. Jesse's Livermore, Jesse's Livermore's book, which is, uh, he wrote it under a, a surname, uh, what do you call it, a pseudonym or whatever, talks a lot about this, that you can't see clearly if you have a position. Uh, Mike Tyson or his manager, one of the two, so everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Unconsciously to himself, he permits his judgment to be swayed by his hopes. Been there, done that, did that today. And I have the, the book coming up in a slide. I forget the name of it. I think it's the psychology of the stock market. Anyway, if you're out of the market and the market's in a really nice trend, you might actually See that it's chopping along or come up with some kind of reasoning as to why you shouldn't be in this really nice trend. Now, say you have a textbook set up and you've been losing a lot of money lately, okay? And this is one thing that I'm really cognizant of. Some people buy when they have money, some people sell when they need money, okay? Quoting Tom McClellan's late mother Marion, and you've been losing money and you see a great looking setup come along and in your head what are you seeing well you're seeing eh, this thing just looks like it's rolling over that doesn't look like a a textbook pullback to the 30 ema i hope we took this trade i don't remember when this was bcli i think we took that one and i hope it worked <laughs> anyway or if it's losing money you might not see anything, okay? You might just see, I don't see the pattern. I don't see the setup. Now, let's say you see a mediocre setup and you're printing money. Something looks like this, kind of chopping back and forth, going sideways. In your head, you might think, ooh, that looks really good. I'm gonna go ahead and pop in that. You know, I'm making so much money. Who cares if I give a little bit of that money? It's, it's worth it, right? And that's where the bad behavior comes in. So. It is the psychology of the stock market. I knew I had to slide in here somewhere. The psychology of the stock market, Cosmo, Cosmo, Cosmo Classics. You can get it off Amazon too. You can get it off my books to read page. GC Selden. Good little book. The average man is not blessed or cursed. However, you may look at it with an analytical mind. We see as through a glass darkly. Our ideas are always enveloped in a haze and our reasoning powers work in a rut from which we find it painful, if not impossible to escape. By the way, George, order this book. <laughs> Many of our emotions and some of our acts are merely automatic responses to an external stimuli. I, as I said, I think last week, I try to be cognizant of my entry orders, especially if they're going to be a market order. And if I do a market order, I try to count to 10 or do something to stop me from just click, click, click. 
And ideally, I want to put in a stop below the market for shorts or above the markets for longs. So I'm not so automatically responding to these external external stimuli. So the flickering ticks, as I think Todd Harrison calls them. I love that. I wish I came up with that. <laughs> wonderful as the development of the human brain, it wonderful as is the, the the language is very flowery in these books, these older books like this, but it's beautiful. Wonderful as is the development of the human brain, it originated from an enlarged ganglion, and its first response is to still is still practically that of the ganglion. I wish I had I need to remember to get my brain out of storage. <laughs> Eve, I thought your mind was in a gutter. No, 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 my brain's in storage. I have a human brain in storage. And makes for a good little prop during a presentation. But even a hundred years ago or more, G.C. Selden, I guess neurologists at the time, knew that our brain has not caught up to modern society. And that's a whole other topic in and of itself to discuss. But a lot of the things we do kind of go back to that caveman type of thing. And, and if you think about it, if you hear like a, a stick or or whatever, crack or whatever, it might be a saber-toothed tiger getting ready to eat you, so you better run. Now, if you're standing or, or sitting in front of your screens and staring at the screens, this danger comes at you, the market's going against you, your immediate impulse is to do something and you're kind of stuck there frozen. And if you, I don't want to go too deep on you or whatever, but if you think about it, that creates a lot of animosity within you because you feel like you have to do something. And that's where kind of getting back to that fewer observations, less is more. And less is more could also mean be more and more selective and figure out what's the most amount of time and most amount of setups you could not trade and then only trade the ones that are really, really, really worth it. Getting back to the garbage in, garbage out. Now, again, we see everything through a prism, and I came up with the idea of a perception prism, and I think this this is not an original thought after doing some Googling. Some others have called it a perception prism, but we're not really seeing what is. We're seeing what our brain manifests what is. We're seeing the market in our mind. We're seeing a lot of times what we want to see, and in some cases, we're seeing what we hope to see. Okay, these are kind of left, those were left over from last week. Crypto Corner, I don't have a lot to say this week other than everything that I've been saying. And I've been talking for a long time about the fact that it's been, it hasn't been a lot of fun lately. And the trend really hasn't been there. And it's been in the bear market. And I, I think. If you go in and look at, I was doing the crypto, coffee and cryptos on Saturday, and it just felt like there wasn't enough to cover every Saturday. It's going down, it's going down, it's going down. So we'll jump into crypto first, and then we'll hop on over to the uh, stocks market. So if there's any crypto you want me to take a look at, I'll get that loaded over here. And then we'll take a look at individual stocks. Just put a dollar sign if it's crypto, just in case I don't recognize the pair. My wife told me one of the best things I've ever done in my trading career was to start the Facebook group, and I tend to agree with her. I always agree with her. <laughs> but trading can be a very lonely sport, and I go in there and tell and, and talk a lot about, hey, I got my ass handed to me. You know what? It happens, spelled with a silent SH. But the great thing about the group is you can interact with others, you can ask for help, and I'll be happy to chime in, but a lot of times, a lot of you guys have, who've been at this for a long time, I'm very humbled by a lot of you guys in there will come in and, and give the correct answer. And I'll also throw out some signs and signals here and there. And like the ogre, I threw that one out a couple of days ago. So if you see something in one of these presentations, I'm not saying that I'm not gonna make it a 100% promise, just in case one or two slip by, but I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time, it came straight from my trading service or straight for something that I brought up in Facebook ahead of time. So, you know, it's not completely hindsight. But anyway, 
the only caveat is to keep the riffraff out, you have to be a gold member at least at DaveLearning.com or on the trading service. All right, let's shift gears and let's go over to crypto real quick. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on crypto. I think I kind of beat the dead horse on it already. It's in a bear market, okay? And it's been in a bear market for quite some time. So let's see if I can get this screen shared over. And here we go. And you know, here's one of those doggy coins, FYI. Now I absolutely printed money in this thing. I even bought me a HODL shirt for Sheeb, Shiba Inu. Well, you know, you talk about, um, I don't know what's the right word, but looking for things or whatever. I'm surprised at the amount of Shiba Inu dogs that I've seen around here since I invested, invested, since I traded the sheep coin. Anyway, you can see this is in a bear market, you know, throw a dart. I am short these, Solana, I'm short Bitcoin, net short Bitcoin, okay? I do have a little hodl thing going on, experiment. Wi-Fi, DAO, and Crow, that's uh, crypto.com. Anyway, if you look at these things and we can sort them by percent change, and uh, most of these things aren't doing so high. It seems like the the doggy coins and all, nobody's excited about that anymore. It's like, I don't know if people call it a census or what. I didn't care when it went straight up. I just, I just bought along like a good little trend following moron. That one looks okay because it's going up, but I, I haven't been too excited about buying much just because as you can see, most are in a bear market and I can't do it on the fly, but you can run a scan and it'll show you all the ones that are above or below the 30 EMA. And you're gonna see that nearly all of them are below the 30 EMA in serious downtrends. It doesn't take a rocket, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that we're dead. And, and what was this guy's name, Sorkin or whatever, said we're either in 1995 or 1999 with crypto, Right now, at least it looks like it's 1999, meaning that like stocks in 99, that was the end of the road. So we'll see. Uh, I think longer term, Bitcoin has promise, not as everybody gets a little confused with that. It's not going to replace a currency, okay? Initially, I think that was the, the motive of the designers or whatever, developers, programmers. But rather, it is a digital asset. And I use that term loosely. But I do think it has potential longer term. But there's no need to rush out and buy it as long as it's headed lower. All right, let's take a look at the overall market. Let me see something here. I need to get the, let's put the bow ties in. So the S&P 500 today, we'll take a look at the spiders. Now it wasn't a straight route lower, but it did gap lower, tried to rally a little bit and then came in, as you can see, losing over 2% of its value. Now overnight, the futures are gapping already higher or lapping higher, I guess in this case. So it should be interesting to see if we get a little bit of a layup. And as I was saying earlier, the most obvious thing for this market to do would be to go would be go down. What does it do first? It goes straight out, squeezes a lot of people out, makes kind of a textbook pullback, sells off really hard today. So tomorrow it'll probably make a big old foot push higher and don't put my feet to the fire. But if it makes a big push higher and then begins to implode, I'm going to be all over it. That might be the play that causes the most pain to the most people. And that's what I'm always asking myself. What would cause the most pain to the most people? And usually that's a big rally and a downtrend followed by a by turning back down. But at a more of a micro level, aha, it's going back to old lows. No, it's not. It's going to go straight back up one more time and then implode. <laughs> but you can see NASDAQ obviously still in a downtrend. Looks a little bit worse than the P's. Russell 2000 didn't get hit too, too bad today. Well, yeah, down a percent. 89, I guess that's pretty bad. But you can see remaining in a downtrend. Looks like it's trying to resume that downtrend. Energies are one of the few areas out there that look okay. Foods are so-so. But energies, you can see just off of all-time highs. We're long KLXE. 
Foods kind of hanging in there. Just kind of can't get too excited about the foods, but it's probably one of the better sectors if you had to buy something. Drugs remain in a downtrend. I've only pulled back. Biotech's even worse. You can see a little bit of sell-off today there. So you get the idea. The overall market not looking so hot. But if it starts going up, starts going up. Well, as trend follows, we'll start following up. Right now, it looks like we're getting ready to have some major sell signals. And it looks like it could be in trouble. Now, whether or not some of these stocks, Facebook or whatever, um, Amazon, I guess, tonight went up. Facebook went, went down yesterday or whatever. If all that, all those big stocks, how that all shakes out, those big growth stocks, so to speak, we'll see what happens. Retail, another area, selling off out of a pullback. Right now, I'm probably mostly bearish on the semis. And the semis can trend nicely. Maybe that's one reason why I like them so much. I would much rather trade the upside in the semis, kind of a bull for the semis, but hey, I'll uh, I'll I'll take what's given, right? If you can't be in the trend you love, love the trend you're in. <laughs> All right, I think I've kind of beat the dead horse on the market. Pay attention to sell signals. Uh, the TFM 10% system will be the first one. I think the bow ties have it really officially triggered. It depends on how you're playing them. But the bow tie was here. Your higher high, the higher low was there. Technically, this would have been a trigger here, but you do want to give them wiggle room. So today's action could have been a trigger in that. And if it gets above this high here, then all bets are off. Let's just see what happens. The market is obviously in trouble still. All right, any individual stocks? I know we talk about stocks in the group all day, but anything not covered, anything you want to talk about? Any questions? MSI for Brett. Hey, Brett, good to see you. I know you an email. Yeah, MSI is actually my Landry list tonight. Uh, usually I won't talk about those, but I forgot. I didn't recognize it as Motorola. Uh, it looks really good. I like it a lot too, Brett. Uh, good eye. Uh, you know, high five on that one. Uh, kind of a, it's a little late to call it a bow tie, but it's technically a bow tie. It's a nice persistent trend lower. This was on my my short list of my shorts tonight too. I had 40 something shorts on my list. So I, I, it's probably impossible not to have a little, uh, for you guys not to find some of the same ones. But yeah, that looks pretty good. Uh, you know, maybe a, I think I'd like it a little bit more if it's a little deeper pullback, but it does look good. And it does look like it's in a lot of trouble. BLDR. Yeah, BLDR looks pretty good. This one did come up. This is in one of my momentum lists. I do recognize it. The The gap here is a little bit concerning, but it's okay, I suppose, because it did close the gap here. It looks like it's rolled back over. So, yeah, good eye on that one, John. INFO. Yeah, this one looks pretty good. Back to you, Brett. I do like it. Nice thrust lower. Let's see what we look like longer term. Yeah, longer term. Yeah, it's the end of the trend, okay? Some people say, what do you mean, Dave, when you say price for perfection? So if I'm seeing a stock up here instead of a pullback, I may take it, but I'm less excited to take a long side pullback after it's been a trend for a long, long, long time because first little bad news comes out, the stock, it's priced for perfection and could implode. So yeah, that one looks good too. These these are the best uh, stocks that I've uh, I've never had three in a row that I liked. So this is we hit a broker record tonight. Good job, guys. Very impressed. Info, yes, we just talked about that one. Wayfair, too late. Let's see. Um, well, it's in a downtrend. Here's the thing. Right now, like those other three on the short side. I'd much rather find a stock that's at really high levels. And that's why you're seeing all these super high price stocks on my Landry list and as official recommendations and runner ups and things like that, because I think they're on the, on the cusp of rolling over, just like the AMD is the opening gap reversal. It's coming off all time highs, big gap higher. And those type of stocks had the potential to just keep rolling over or, or beginning of a big leg down. Whereas this one was kind of all over the place wide and loose, then it finally begins to trend. So yeah, I would say too late on that for now. Now, if we get to a bear market and we're six months into the bear market, then that's all you're gonna have is these longer term pullbacks, okay? What do you think of stocks like leg for shorts where there's no 
support below for years back. Well, let's see. So you're saying it has no legs to stand on. Let's try it out. Let's see. Well, again, you know, your 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 short would have been right here, okay, way back last July. A perfect hindsight, both sides to the downside, but it did have a lot of support below. So I probably wouldn't have taken that one back then. Um, yeah, I hear what you're saying. It's the next the next support's down at 22. But ideally, again, you want to find something at a little bit higher levels. Um, I forget the first one that was brought up by Matt, but that first one that was brought up earlier kind of fit that description. You're welcome, Sam. Okay, Big Dave, you were early on this one. I'm not looking at the chart, so it might be too late. RH, yeah, restoration hardware. Yeah, this is one that we talked about a while back. And the question is, is it too late? Well, it doesn't look like as late as that leg or whatever. This one does look like it has a new leg down, but you can see it's rolled over in here. You know, that's okay. There's just so many other shorts out there you could find at higher levels, but there's certainly nothing wrong with this particular stock, okay? Go through the semis. There's a lot in the semis. That'll, that'll, you're welcome. <laughs> There's a lot of great shorts in the semis. All right, Brett. I saw several of these, but I'm guessing it's roughly the same as the others. Ha ha. Thank you so much for the advice. Yeah, yeah. It was 40 something stocks on the short side tonight. A lot of semis I really like as shorts. And I was going through those, uh, trying to figure out which ones I like the most on the short side. So, yeah, definitely. All right, any others? Going once, going twice. Well, as usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. For don't talk to you now and then. Everybody have a great weekend. Does the brain you have in the storage belong to Abby Normal? <laughs> Where'd you get it? Abby, Abby Normal? <laughs> I should write that on the, uh, that's a good idea. I'll put a little sticky on it, Abby Normal. All right, everybody, have a great weekend. Thank you so much, and may the trend be with you. Y'all welcome.